When it comes to cars from socialist countries, the conclusion is often the same. Safety was secondary, and human life was rarely a priority. Well, let's set the socialist block aside for a moment and look at how things worked on the western side of the Iron Curtain. Was human life there truly more important than profit? Or did it have a price there as well? It's no secret that the expansion of European and Japanese compact cars into the U.S. market began long before the oil crisis of 1973. By the late 1960s, Detroit was already feeling growing pressure from imports, and the most unexpected challenge came from the German Volkswagen Beetle, which had been sold in the United States since 1949. For a long time, Detroit executives simply ignored this small German oddity rooted in the pre-war era, convinced it posed no real threat to sales of true American cars. That perception changed when Volkswagen began selling nearly 500,000 Beetles a year, and in some markets, Los Angeles among them, it even became the best-selling car. At that point, all four major American automakers realized that holding on to future market share would require something they had long avoided, compact cars of their own. Ford was among those affected as well. A company used to dominating its home market suddenly found itself in the position of a follower. At first, Ford considered selling its European model, the Ford Cortina, in the United States. The car was very successful in the United Kingdom, but in the American market, it failed to achieve commercial success. After that, company management, led by Lee Iacocca, decided to develop a new car from scratch, taking the specifics of the American automotive market into account. Development of the Pinto began in the late 1960s and followed an unusual path from the start. Normally, creating a new model took about 43 months, but Iacocca gave the team a strict deadline from concept to production in no more than 25 months. Ford simply could not afford more time. The reason was the same as before, the growing pressure from European and Japanese imports. The requirements also included a curb weight of no more than 2,000 pounds and a target price not exceeding $2,000. To meet both the schedule and the technical targets, engineers had to deliberately overlook problematic areas of the design. Many flaws remained in the final construction simply because there was no time left to test and redesign them. The Ford Pinto debuted on September 11, 1970. The base version was equipped with a 1.6-liter inline four-cylinder engine producing 75 horsepower, or an optional two-liter engine paired with either a four-speed manual transmission or a three-speed automatic. The base price was $1,850, which looked more than attractive, especially considering that the Volkswagen Beetle in its own base version, was only $11 cheaper. The car also received a twin under Ford's Mercury sub-brand, the Bobcat. Despite the fact that by American standards, the new Ford was rather modestly equipped and its interior could easily be described as minimalist, buyers took to it quite favorably. Sales were strong in the first months. By 1971, Ford had sold around 350,000 Pintos, and in 1972, a station wagon body style was added to the lineup. At that point, it seemed that Ford had found its gold mine and was preparing for long-term leadership in the American compact car segment. But very soon, everything changed dramatically. By 1972, reports began to emerge suggesting that, even in relatively minor rear-end collisions, the design of the Pinto allowed the fuel filler neck to break, causing gasoline to spill. In more severe impacts, there was also a risk that the fuel tank itself could be punctured by elements of the rear bumper mounts or suspension components. The Pinto's fuel tank was located only about 25 centimeters from the rear bumper, and its level of protection proved to be insufficient. The injuries sustained in such accidents were often not particularly severe. The real problem lay elsewhere. People were dying because they were unable to escape burning cars, either due to severe body deformation or jammed doors. Ford's situation was further complicated by a wave of media coverage. Journalists reported that company management had been aware of this vulnerability as early as the testing phase. However, due to the extremely tight development schedule, no changes were made to the design. Ford continued to refuse modifications even after the issue became public knowledge, insisting that the accident statistics 
were within acceptable limits, and that the Pinto had no design flaws, especially none that posed a threat to human life. Nevertheless, in that same year, 1972, Ford faced its first major lawsuit, later known as Grimshaw v. Ford Motor Company. The case stemmed from a crash in San Bernardino, California, in which Lily Gray was killed, and a 13-year-old boy, Richard Grimshaw, suffered severe burns. The victim's family was awarded $2.5 million in compensation, while Grimshaw received $600,000. Ford itself was initially fined $125 million, although that amount was later reduced to $3.5 million. In 1974, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration became involved and demanded that Ford recall the already sold Pintos and correct the defect. In practice, however, this demand was largely formal. The agency concluded that the available evidence was insufficient to mandate a compulsory recall. In effect, Ford was encouraged, but not legally required, to recall the problematic vehicles. Ford chose not to initiate a recall campaign. Despite all the scandals and court cases, production, and more importantly, sales, continued. In 1974, more than half a million Ford Pintos were sold. While this year marked the production peak, the decline that followed was not seen as a collapse, but rather as a natural downturn in the model's life cycle. In the years that followed, Pinto sales still amounted to hundreds of thousands of cars annually. In 1976, the model received minor cosmetic updates, along with a new 2.8-liter V6 engine producing 102 horsepower. It began to feel as if the most intense phase of the scandal was over and that the worst was behind Ford. But as it soon became clear, that was not the case. In 1977, Mother Jones published an article that turned the technical debate around the Pinto into a national scandal. The article stated that Ford's management not only knew about the fuel tank vulnerability before the Pinto entered mass production, but it also conducted a series of rear impact crash tests. In many of those tests, the fuel tank was damaged or ruptured. Fires failed to occur in only three cases, and only because those cars were fitted with rubber fuel bladders manufactured by Goodyear. The article also compared the Pinto with the European Ford Capri. The so-called Euro Mustang proved to be significantly safer than the Pinto. But this was not the core of the scandal. Even before the article was published, many already believed that Ford's leadership was aware of the issue and deliberately kept it quiet. The real scandal lay elsewhere. Journalists obtained an internal Ford analytical memo dated 1970. The document showed that before the Pinto ever reached production, the company had carried out cost comparisons between redesigning the car and the projected cost of human lives, injuries, and potential legal settlements. The estimated cost of modifying the cars was $137 million. Leaving the design unchanged, according to Ford's own calculations, would likely result in lawsuits totaling about $49.5 million. At first glance, $137 million seems excessive for what appeared to be a relatively minor design change, especially at the start of production. But Ford's calculations were based on the assumption of a potential large-scale recall in the future. In reality, the cost of the fix amounted to just $11 per car. This document later became known as the Pinto Memo. The fallout was enormous. The Pinto's reputation collapsed almost overnight. Ford was accused of cynicism and penny-pinching, and the company was flooded with lawsuits. In 1978, the NHTSA ordered Ford to begin a recall to address the defect in more than 1.5 million already sold Pintos, along with roughly 500,000 Mercury-branded counterparts. Lee Iacocca was ultimately named as the main figure responsible, and he eventually lost his position. The long-suffering Ford Pinto received a facelift in 1979, but by that point, it could no longer save the model. Sales were declining not because of the car's appearance, but because of its reputation. The Pinto had become firmly associated with danger, and even the design changes and the recall campaign failed to reverse that image. Production ended in 1980, quietly, routinely, and without any ceremonial farewell. The total production volume, however, was quite substantial, around 3 million cars. Yet the Pinto story continued to haunt the American public for years. In 1991, American lawyer and law professor Gary T. Schwartz 
attempted to challenge much of what had been written about the Pinto in the media. According to his research, the number of fatalities was 27, not several hundred as widely reported. He also argued that placing the fuel tank behind the rear axle was not unusual for cars of that era, and that the number of deaths fell within the acceptable statistical range for comparable vehicles of the time. To be fair, Schwartz was not the only one who questioned the scale of the negative narrative surrounding the Pinto. Still, criticism followed the car for decades. In 2004, Forbes included the Pinto on its list of the worst cars in history. In 2009, it was also named one of the ugliest cars ever made, a claim the author of this channel strongly disagrees with, finding the Ford Pinto quite attractive, especially in wagon form. One way or another, the Ford Pinto has permanently entered history as a symbol of corporate greed and irresponsibility. Let me know in the comments what you think about this story. Was Ford treated fairly? Or was the Pinto scandal amplified by competitors and aggressive media pressure?